Good job. Is anybody happy this morning? Mama, you happy? I'm glad you're happy. I'm glad to see everybody. Let me say welcome to all of you who are here. This is going to be a great day. All right, now we need to go through our exercises today, okay? All right, ready? On, on three, we're going to take a big old deep breath. Ready? One, two, three. Just let it out. And everybody just relax. I bet mean, you've had a challenging week. Maybe a little more than normal. Well, I just want you to know it's okay. You can make it to Sunday. And so we're just going to have our little family reunion time today. Thank you for being here. I am thrilled to see uh, everybody that's here. If you're our guest, thank you and welcome. We love having you. And uh, so we just want to have a good time today. Let's see. Um, somebody, somebody, now, somebody had a birthday yesterday. And I am not going to say how old it is. Who is it, Cecil? Cecil. <laughs> Mr. Jenkins had a birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, buddy. We appreciate that. We celebrate things like that around here. And uh, I believe that Tony and Peggy have an anniversary today. Is that right? Congratulations. Find, we look for stuff to celebrate around here, and we love to uh, laugh and just have a good time together, and uh, so we're excited about today. Glenn, won't you come on up? We're going to do prayer time, and uh, we always like to start with prayer. We'll go orange. Glenn, if you go ahead and make some prayer time. Well, you know, whatever works. I was kidding, the pastor at Oranges in Tennessee. Works for me. Works for me too. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Raise your hand if you're thankful for air conditioning. <laughs> We're real thankful. <laughs> I heard real thankful over here. Yeah, I, I understand that those who work on air conditioning systems and units are a little busy right now. Um, Anybody in here know how to work on air conditioning systems? I see one hand. Okay. Anybody in here not have air conditioning right now? Did I see a hand up over there, Stacy? All right. Maybe it's a match made in heaven right here. Somebody works on air conditioning. Somebody doesn't have air conditioning. Maybe, maybe we can help. So uh, take note of anybody who does not have air conditioning and let's help those who don't have it right now because it is extremely, extremely warm. One of the things I like about our family here is how we take it uh, naturally to encourage one another. And y'all probably heard me say this before, or have heard it said before, how can you tell, how can you study somebody and know that they need encouragement? It's real simple. If they're breathing. Okay? It's real simple. We all need encouragement. No matter what we're going through, sometimes others know what we're going through, but most of the time they don't because we don't really like to, to talk about it. But one of the things that the Bible says that we should do is encourage one another. Encourage one another in the Lord. And let me read this and, and then we'll, we'll pray. This is from 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 12 through 15. So again, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 15. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Anybody know anybody who's disruptive? My goodness. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Be patient with who? Everyone. Not just some. 
be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. A lot of every's in there. And this morning I was reading about when Jesus was getting ready to be betrayed by Judas. And he was betrayed by Judas right after Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. Now, Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed, but whose feet did he wash? Judas. Everyone. He washed all his disciples' feet. So it's kind of amazing when you think he knew that Judas was going to turn him in, hand him over, deceive him, but yet he washed his feet anyway. That's kind of cool when you think about it. So, um, three words I want to leave you with, and then we'll pray. Encourage means courage within. You think Jesus had any courage? Absolutely. So if Jesus is in us, we will naturally encourage others. How about enthusiasm? You ever thought about that word? That's derived from the Latin for enthos. <clears throat> Excuse me, enthos. Thos meaning theology. Theo meaning God. So enthusiasm is God within. So you've got courage within, God within, and then inspiration. Inspired. What is that? Spirit within. So if you are inspirational, you have the Holy Spirit within you. If you are enthusiastic, you have God within you. And if you are an encourager, you have courage within you. You have Jesus within you. So let's all strive. Let's all work at, at being an encouragement. Here we go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we delight in you, God. Thank you, God, for seasons. Yes, even the hot season, Lord. We praise you for air conditioning, Lord. We pray for anybody in this room, Lord, who does not have air conditioning, and even those across Cabarrus County, God, who may not have AC, Lord. We ask that you look for ways that we could help them, that we could reach out to those with, without AC. And Lord, we thank you for the encouragement that you give us. You've taught us to encourage ourselves in you, because sometimes we don't get encouragement when we want it. So God, we thank you that you are the source of encouragement, our source of life, our source of, of water, our source of, of just celebration. As Pastor said earlier, we celebrate things here. God, today we celebrate you. Lord, we lift up our pastor and ask that you be with him as he brings truth to us today. Truth and life and encouragement. God, open our ears to hear what you have for us today, God. Open our eyes to see what you see. And Lord, we just praise you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Carol, if if we need to get some guys to come over and lay hands on that air, <laughs> I mean, whatever we need to do, lay hands on that thing for healing. Uh, I know that y'all have been praying this week. We've had things, sometimes things seem to come in, in cycles. And we have had a lot of folks we've been praying for. Uh, we've been praying for Mark Childress, who's not able to be with us today. He's at home. He has that knee replacement. And he is probably most unhappy that he's not able to be here today. So I want you to keep praying and, uh, for him. By the way, his sister is with us today. Dee is with us today. Can we can we all help you welcome Dee? I know you've been praying for Chad also, Chad Barringer, and he had surgery, and I know that you've been praying for Kim Love, who's here. Where's Kim at? Kim, how, we got the, how we doing there? Good? Perfect. All right. Um, and I have been concerned about Loretta, and Loretta spent a little time at uh, down Northeast last weekend, but she got home, and she is here today, and we are so glad, Loretta, that you're here. Uh, I just thank the Lord that, that you're back and okay and getting better. And so uh, I want you to know your family loves you. And uh, we're glad to see you too. All right? And uh, Miss Ann is not yet back with us, but she's coming home this week. Right? It's uh, Friday. Miss Ann is going to be back, and I know you missed her. So a lot of people with, with things, and so I appreciate you praying, church. I appreciate your, your, the family and the prayers. Uh, and so we're, we're thankful for that. Now, Janet, can you help us with our rooms today? 
that sheet and the, it was all up there, so it's all good. You can eat. So anyway, men, uh, this Saturday, nine o'clock, prayer break. And let's see, our youth retreat is coming up, and there should be a place to sign up for that. Um, make sure David has sign up. Megan and I have sign up sheets. See David and Megan for that, and that is going to be. I really, really, parents, I really want all our team to get them there, get them to the retreat. That's kind of our fall thing, and we're excited about that. Okay. Uh, all right. I think that's everything except my favorite thing. What is my favorite thing? Y'all are so smart. We have a new family today that I'm going to introduce you to. Shane and Tammy, y'all come up here. Woo! What'd you say? That's ah, what I thought she said. <laughs> no, she's not. Uh, these guys, and again, they're they're not new. You, you, you recognize them and know them, and uh, they make the long trek from the booming metropolis of Alamar on Sunday mornings, and and. Uh, been coming and we talked and we prayed and uh, they they said well you know what it's time and, uh, and so today they come forward and this is how we do it to publicly uh, you know take their position in this CCMP family and and the thing I like about it is, is God has led them here just like He has all of you God is no accidents right and God has led them here. They've already been a blessing, and uh, I am thrilled to say welcome home, and I'm honored to be your pastor. Okay? And so, help me welcome to Jane. You're so good. You're so good to us. God, uh, I just, I'm amazed at what you've done here in this place with these people. And God, it really don't matter where we meet. Because you're here. And your family's here. God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored and I'm thankful to welcome Shane and Tammy into our family today. Well, God, thank you. And Lord, I pray we would bless them and encourage them and inspire them and love them and, and God I know they're going to they're going to bless us as well. The Lord thank you for this couple. Bless them and use them in every way. And thank you again for letting them be here today with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, time for a break, couple minute break. Get the kids to all their classes and head head back in for school worship. Good morning. How many years have you been Twenty-three years. Now you're talking to the camera, Mr. Dickens. In May of this year. Myself and my hot godly wife celebrated 26 years of marriage ourselves. It's been the best 26 years of her life, I can assure you. <laughs> and it's been the worst 26 years of my mother in law life. Stepping on holy ground. This doesn't necessarily have anything to do with anything, but when Sue and I got married in college, which nobody but people in college wants me to say. It was a great thing for us. I was so in love with my wife, I was in a four-car pileup the first time that we were driving home to Florida to see my dear sweet mother-in-law. <laughs> so the greeting for my dear sweet future mother-in-law was, oh, sorry, I almost killed your daughter on the way home. <laughs> Back then, I was not nearly as super refined as I am now. <laughs> long hair and other kind of crazy stuff and I'm sure she thought Lord have mercy my daughter has turned into some sort of weird hippie off in college and went home 
you know, we were like you guys. We made this marriage commitment 26 years ago. And I don't know what your vows were like, but they usually all have something about what for better, for worse, for richer, or for yeah. in sickness and in. When you think about that relationship and that commitment that we make, a lot of people don't make it 23 years anymore, do they? A lot of people don't make it three years anymore. It kind of breaks your heart when you see what families go through. When you start thinking about that commitment, man, when it's when you find the right person, it's not hard to love to see what we're married to her. It's really hard. Man, you think about that commitment. In some days, in some weeks, in some years, there's plenty. And some days there's not much, right? And sometimes there's sickness and sometimes there's death. When you think about our relationship with the Lord, it's kind of the same way. And in some sense, when we became believers, we made that same commitment to Him. And I suspect that most of you would pretty much say that, you know, a bad day with Jesus is better than a good day without Him, right? Something maybe even a little more beautiful because you know our you know, our commitment didn't always 100%. But, you know, in some sense, Jesus made the same commitment to us, didn't he? The sickness and the health, which are poor, better or worse, and he always keeps his commitment to us. He always loves us. He always cares for us. So regardless of our day and of the week, regardless of how our job's going. It's always something to celebrate. And it's always worth lifting up the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Stand up. Let's sing this morning.
want y'all to know this is a this is a safe place. This is a safe place. You can you can let your guard down. You can be yourself. The things that you wrestle with, struggle. Battles. You know, it's the irony of that is the the way to win is to surrender. You just give it up. There's there's such a there's such a peace. And a, you know, when you get vulnerable before God. And you just wrestle with something. And some of y'all right now, there's there's something big that you're just you wrestle with. It's just a battle. And I want you to know, you just give that up to God today. Just let it go. Just stop fighting. And I know, I know it is so much my nature to fight back. And, and grab it and wrestle with it and, and figure it out and work it out. I'm going to tell you something. There's just certain things we're not going to be able to figure out. And there's just some things we're not going to be able to work out. So let's just give it to God today. Lord, I'm just so glad for, for the spirit of freedom that is here in this place. And God, it really don't matter if it's a school or a barn. It doesn't matter where we are because You're here. Our sovereign King is here. And God, You want to work on our behalf. So, Lord, I'm praying for, for myself and for others who are wrestling with something today. A big thing. Struggle. God, we just wave the white flag today. God, we just surrender. We give it up. I'm, we're tired of it. Just tired of, of fighting. And, and Lord, it, it may be a relationship, it may be an addiction. And, and we've realized, God, that we're not going to win. <coughs> but you can win for us. You've already won. God, I thank you for the spirit of love that is here today. God, I thank you for this family. Thank you for the happy faces. I thank you that you are God. And we just, as best we know how to do, we surrender all of it to you right now. So God, open our hearts and, and speak truth into our heart and our life through your word today. Clear our minds of all the clutter. Thank you for the, the way that you are changing our lives together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 8. A uh, couple things. Um, I get I stumble around up here and I missed two two announcements. One one is our choir kickoff is coming up. And it's in here in your bulletin. I just I get run through things and forget things and skip things. August 6th. Now, some of y'all, I know that you enjoy, you love our worship, our choir and our worship teams and our orchestras. And some of y'all are thinking in your heart, you know, I, I, can, I can do that. I can sing. I can play. And, and that's probably the Holy Spirit prodding you to do that. So, um, you need to come out when we kick off our fall. We do a lot of fall things coming up. And, and you can come see Joy or just show up and really, really think about that. It's, it, you, 
if God has given you something, then he gave it to you to use for him and for his kingdom. So just, just think about that. And the other thing is that I'm really, really excited about, and um, I, I, think, I guess this is the first time I'm going to introduce this in, in our service. Uh, we have an amazing youth group, and we have had, and we've got great leaders. Well, this fall, we're going to launch another aspect of that youth ministry. We are going to launch our inaugural middle school youth group. In, in, in the past, thank you, parent of the middle school. <laughs> that was a very honest response. <laughs> I have a place for him to go on Sunday night. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, this has been on my heart for a long time because I am still a youth pastor at heart. Uh, in some ways, I'm still a kid at heart. So I love, really, really, really love the age group, 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade. It's a, it's a very important developmental stage of our kids and, and they're passing out of our children's ministry which has been vibrant and exciting and, and we're moving them into a brand new ministry that will be our middle school youth group and it'll be six seven and eighth graders and it's, i'm just so pumped about that and, and so i want you to pray if you have kids in that those grades in that age group uh, bring them out on sunday nights and that also means now that we can focus even more singularly on our high school youth group, which will be 9, 10, 11, and 12th graders. And so we'll have that this fall. All of that will kind of uh, launch at our youth retreat in, in the fall and we'll into our Sunday night program. And I'm, I'm just really excited about that. It's going to take us to another level. Uh, so pray about that. And, and, and it could be that some of you maybe would like to volunteer to be a, a helper a leader in that age group, and uh, certainly we, we are putting together our leadership teams right now for that, so I'm pumped about that. Um, how many of you have taken your vacation already? Okay, how I many of you have not yet taken your vacation? See, now there's a difference in the enthusiasm of those two responses. <laughs> yes, I've taken my vacation. <laughs> can't believe it's over. I need another vacation to get over my vacation. And so here's the thing, and I, I kind of talk about this sometimes, but uh, you work hard. You earn your days off. We like vacations here at Community Church. Go take your vacation. Go make memories with your family. Go to the beach. Do what you do and enjoy it. And we don't, there's no guilt here, okay? We don't feel, well, yeah, I'm going to go to the Or I'm going to go, yeah, here's one. Uh, well, don't, we're going to go to the, to the coast. Because it just sounds frivolous to say the beach, you know. <laughs> so we're just going to go over there, uh, you know. Come on, y'all. Go to the beach and have fun. Okay? You've earned your vacation. It's summertime. And it's moving quickly. So congratulations. If you haven't yet taken yours, it's coming. You count the days. I know you are. You might as well be honest. Go have fun. Just remember how to get home. Because <laughs> I know what you Oh, I just wish I could stay here. I got it. But come home and remember we play hard and we work hard. We come build this church. And uh, thank you for, for man. Uh, Sherry, is, this, is the beach still there? It's still there. Still there. <laughs> All right. Just, 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 you know, I wanted that to me feel more secure knowing that it's still over there. And so some of y'all get ready to go. Go have fun. And, and uh, just, just go, you know, that's, that's okay. It's, we, we, we like to be transparent and, and vulnerable and honest. Honest is a, is a new concept for some, but it's something we like to work on here. Genesis chapter 8. Now, this is uh, Sermon 3 in our three-part series. So this is the finale of our study from Genesis. We've, we've covered 
several chapters. We talked about Enoch and we talked about Noah and, and the fascinating story about the ark and the animals and lots of facts that maybe you were reminded of or maybe had not heard. And so today we're going to do a really neat story. And, and it's, it's a story that you've heard of. And perhaps when you were a kid, and, and remember that, that, uh, that storybook that I told you about with all the pictures. Thank you for the picture. Um, that tower of Babel. And we, we heard about it, read about it. So today we're going to really read some things that we, it's really in the Bible. And we're going to really read these verses about that story. And we're going to learn some neat things from Genesis. And then uh, next week we will do a standalone message that will be series. And I'm excited, kind of a little bit of a, a fun thing we're going to do next week. And then we're going to get into our next series as we move into uh, August. Can you believe it? Um, by the way, that's good news because football season is getting closer. <laughs> Oh, we got some football fans back there. All right, good. Okay, uh, Genesis chapter 8, and I want us to start about verse 20, and then we'll read some verses, and I want to uh, catch you up a little bit with some background and then, then make some observations as we move, actually move into chapter 11. We won't read all the verses, but we want to highlight some things for you. The Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 8, look at verse 20. Now, remember, we left off last week right here in the ark, and, and God told Noah, I want you to build this big giant boat. And Noah said, By the way, somebody remember, did y'all ever hear that Bill Cosby piece on yes. Noah? Did y'all? Sorry, this is one of those voices that. So, so Noah's walking along, and he goes, Noah. Did y'all hear that story? Yeah. And I know Bill Cosby's kind of a bad guy, but that. that jumped out at me when I was doing that yesterday, last week. And so Noah just, and the ark landed. And last week it landed and, and he sent the birds out and so it parked on top of this mountain called Mount Ereb. And so here we pick up in, in this story right here, verse 20. Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Remember now, he'd been on that boat for a long time with all those animals, with the zoo, the floating zoo, and it finally stopped. And he got off and got open the door and he said, now y'all go. The first thing he did is right here, verse 20. Celebrated. And he did it by building an altar. And he worshipped God. And he said, God, thank you. You did this. You preserved us. You kept your word. You saved us. And you got us off that boat from all those animals. Thank you. You probably worship too after you've been on a boat with all those animals for that long. So that's what happens. It was the first thing you did. And I'm reminded. That's what I need to do. I need to build an altar. You don't have to be at church to build an altar. You can make an altar in your office. In your kitchen, in your nursery, sometimes we need to just stop and say, God, thank you. You're so awesome. Thank you, God. And He did. Great example. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. Some of y'all do these uh, little things that, that put off aromas. What do you call those things? Inside. Incense. Well, incense. And then there's these other things. And, and I like candles. And, and, and some, some of us choose to wear personal aromas. And God liked to smell things. God was very alert with His senses. And, and it, it's interesting to note in verse 21, the Lord smelled something. God smell when he smells you. <coughs> he smelled Noah and he smelled something wonderful. And it, it was this thankful spirit of worship that Noah built an altar with his family and God smelled it and he said, That's awesome. That's wonderful. I like that smell. When you worship God, he likes that aroma of thankfulness coming from you. 
You want to smell good? <laughs> That's okay. We like participation here. I I'll tell you this. It's better, if you're going to smell, you might as well smell good. Might as well smell pleasant. And you can smell really good to God. And the alternative would be, how would you like it if God thinks you stink? If, if your attitudes and thoughts and actions smell bad to God. Interesting. So, God loved that smell. It was a sweet savor. And the Lord said in His heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So God was happy with Noah. And he, he loved that aroma and fragrance of worship and thankfulness. And He made a vow and He made a promise. In verse 22, While the earth remaineth in seed time and harvest, and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. You know what he's saying here? Noah and the ark is over. The ark has landed and he opens the door and says, Now y'all go ahead and get on with your life. Everything is new. I've remade everything. There will be days and nights and summers and winters and springs and falls and seasons and life goes on. That's God's economy. That's how it is. Sometimes bad, hard things happen. But guess what? When you get up in the morning, even though you don't want to, the sun comes up and life goes on. Because God is faithful and He's out there doing His thing. And there's encouragement and comfort in that. So we move through the end of Noah and the ark into chapter 9. So let's move into chapter 9, which is going to kind of segue us into the story. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. And, really important word, replenish the earth. We start over. We, we remove all of, of the humans and all the animals because things have gotten really bad. So now that's done. It's all fresh and clean and new. And God says, Noah, you guys go on out there and start over and spread out and replenish the earth. And life goes on. And so this is where we pick up the next story. And the fear of you... Now, this is interesting. I won't read all these verses, but this starts to get interesting here. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every what? Every animal, every beast of the field, and upon every fowl of the air. And you're like, yeah, I got that right. <laughs> yeah, they'll fear me. Because I'm, you know, and that's that's maybe not quite that graphically. That's kind of what he's saying here. Man will have dominion on this planet Earth. The beasts of the field will now fear man. Because I've given you dominion. And I want you to go out and begin to establish your dominion over the earth and the fowls of the air and the beasts of the earth upon all the moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Whew, I'm glad because, you know, us fishermen, glad to hear that. God's given us some, some dominion over those fishes. Into your hand are they delivered. Thank you, Lord. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Now, I understand I don't mean to be... Uh, I know there's some PETA people or whoever they are that think, you know, it, it's... It, and I, I'm not... A, look, I was raised on a farm. I was raised to respect animals and take care of our animals and treat them with respect. But listen, can I say this in love? They're not humans. I love it. I, Trust me, I've, God has differentiated and given men dominion. Not to abuse, please. Not to, not to take advantage or abuse that. But God has given the human beings dominion on this planet. It, it is abused often. But this is what we're seeing as, as life starts beginning again for these people. And so, just some interesting thoughts and, and facts here. He says, Every moving thing 
that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you in all I've given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Now there's here's here's let me tell you what's happening. God is establishing some ground rules for life on this planet. Because the first time men sinned and their hearts became so evil that they messed it all up really bad. And so God said, okay, I, I, I feel broken about that. So I've got to eradicate that. I'm going to start over, Noah, with you and your family. Except this time, there's going to be some ground rules. You with me? Yes. The first time, men destroyed. They abused everything because their hearts were so wicked. And God said, man... That, 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 that hurts me that it's like that. So we're going to have to start over. Except this time, I'm going to establish some ground rules so that they don't destroy themselves again. Surely your blood of your lives will I require. Verse 5. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life. Do you know what's happened? God is saying, no more is life on earth a free-for-all. There are now some rights and wrongs and some evils and some laws that we will obey. You take a life, a life will be taken. We're starting to see the establishment of life as it should be controlled on earth. <clears throat> Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. <clears throat> and you, verse 7, be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And then let's skip down to verse 13. And he we have the whole rainbow story here. I do set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. The rainbow is not a random, beautiful spectacle created by nature. It is a message from God to us. Clearly, it is not someone's symbol. It's a... <laughs> oh, man. My God, rainbow. I've got to stay focused here. The rainbow's been around a long time. A lot longer than a lot of people that think that it's theirs. It's not. It is a, do you know what a covenant is? A covenant is, a, is the Old Testament word for pledge, a promise. God made a promise and He sealed it with the rainbow. And it was a message to us that He would not destroy humankind again with the flood. That was accomplished. It was done. Life goes on. God had His way. And now let's move forward, folks. It's time to move on. Thank you. Alright, let me give you some... If you have your bulletin, there's, a four, there's four little outline points here that we'll try to follow some thoughts. And then we're going to get into... Before we stop, we'll get into chapter 11. And that kind of leads us into the story of the tower. After the flood, so point one is there's cooperation. Life has been ended and now it has been started again. A new beginning. Plant life began to burst forth from the earth. A new, clean world. A fresh beginning. You know what He did? He gave man a redo. We got a mulligan. Now, when I play golf with Frank, I get a pastoral mulligan every once in a while. <laughs> because I'm not good sometimes. So I get a read it. Well, God, man messed up that. Because we were so wicked and evil and rotten and sinful and violent and all that. And God said, enough. Just end all that. I'm going to give you a read it. I'm, I'm glad. God does that. God's good like that. You're, you know what? Some of you are sitting here today and you're thinking, man, I have messed up. I, I am a failure. I've, I'm useless. I can't... Guess what? 
there's hope for you. In fact, you are a wonderful candidate for the grace of God because He'll give you a redo. He'll give you another chance. Because He loves you that much. And it's so awesome that our God gives us a redo. The only people in the world were Noah and his wife, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their wives. Imagine that. That's the only people on the earth. Verse 22, we got God's promise. Seasons and days and nights would remain, and it would not cease. Life had begun again. Chapter 9, God now said, Be fruitful and multiply and spread out over all the earth and replenish the earth. Replenish is the word that describes what's going on on the earth at this time. After the flood. There were changes after the flood. Now, and sometimes I'll hear people say, well, you know, life was 80,000 million billion years old and, and there, how come there was not dinosaurs today and there's this and there's all these kind of discrepancies and, and historical gigantic question marks. Well, this answers a lot of those questions because after the flood, there was another start. And there were some things that were different after the flood than before the flood. For example, there was a new kind of food source. It was meat. Thank you, Lord. That, that's, that's not a biblical thought. That's just because I like red meat. I just enjoy it. And I respect you if you know about that. We're good. But God said, you know what, now you can go eat meat. It's a new day. You can kill and eat the flesh of animals. We just read that. Which before the flood had not been done. There's some new rules. There's some new laws after the flood. If anyone sheds human blood, that person's blood is to be shed by man. In fact, God said to men, I want you to organize yourselves into some form of structure. You know what the word for that is today? Y'all, you're not going to like this. It's a bad word. It's the G word. Government. The Bible will mess up a lot of good theology. God established the government. Did you know that? He did that here because he saw the first time there were no laws and no government and no policemen and no structure and it got terrible. It got so bad out of control that everyone was violent and destroyed each other. Second time around, God said, okay now Noah, you got your redo. I want you to go spread out and you can, you can kill and eat certain animals and, and you can now have some organization in your life and you need to have some leaders. And you need to have some laws to keep everybody from killing each other. And the world from going crazy like it had done before. And God established order. God is not a God of randomness. God is not a God of chaos and confusion. Guess who is? Our enemy is a God of chaos and confusion. God is a God of order. Don't curse something that God ordained. It's not God's fault that we have bad politicians. It's a good plan. It's a necessary plan. Organize yourself into some form of government and have laws and leaders so you can govern yourselves. So I won't have to destroy everybody again. God said you know what that is? That's love. That's grace. That's God saying, let me help you humans to live on this planet safely. To slow down the amount of time it would take to become as violent as before the flood. God says, I'm going to give you a redo, but I've got some additions that we're going to make. Before the flood, there was no government. Before the flood, there were no kings, no presidents, no policemen, no jails, no rules, no laws. There was chaos and violence 
And had God not destroyed humanity with the flood, guess what would have happened? Man would have destroyed themselves. Because there was no order, no structure. So, let's keep things in perspective. Before you curse things that we don't think are going our way, let's keep that in. It's not God's fault. The idea is a good one. God ordained human government. And we read it here. Just like anything else that God ordained, men have found a way to abuse it. Who, who created music? God did. Has man found a way to mess that up? Um, okay. God created sex to be a blessing to us. A crown, a reward to solidify our relationships. Guess what man has done with that gift? Abused it. That's the cycle. God creates it and man, out of the darkness of his heart, finds a way to mess it up. God ordained human government for the good and the safety of man. He commands us to respect and obey our leaders and our laws. In fact, God instructed us to pray for our leaders. He did not say, if you like this guy, you need to pray for him. He said, pray for those that are in authority, or that, that, are, that are in a place of the structure that God has ordained. Now, you better go vote. If you're not going to exercise your right, don't sit over there and whine. You go vote and do your part and obey God and move forward. Because God ordained government. God gave us that rainbow, that covenant, that promise. When you go to a wedding, the, the, the most important part of that wedding is when the bride and the groom say vows to each other. They say vows to the officiant, to the pastor, to the preacher, and then they turn and say vows to each other. And they say a vow of eternal value. And they say, I will love you no matter what. That comes from God. It's a promise. It's a pledge. And, and how lightly do we take vows today? Do you know that people's signature means nothing anymore? You know what? I remember. I remember my daddy taught me. He said, what? When you when you work with somebody, you 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 shake their hand and look them in the eye. Just, did your daddy ever tell you that? You shake their hand and look them in the eye, and you got their word, and we're good. Man, that used to work. It should work because when God makes a vow, He keeps it, and He made us a vow with a rainbow. He said, "I won't destroy the earth with the flood." In that manner again, to fulfill His promise, He set up. New city. Things changed after the flood. There was a new water cycle. And he talks about all this in, in chapter 9 and moving into chapter... He talks about all these new systems. There's, there's rain and evaporation and there's wind currents and there's ocean currents. All of that is, is how God keeps this earth in orbit in this universe. All of those water currents and air currents and all of that, how it works. I don't understand it. I can't figure it all out, but God set it all in motion. And He created all this to, to maintain life for us. These systems of nature would control the climate and prevent destruction by flood and worldwide local floods and, and things that occur. But, and, and we see things now. Uh, my wife's favorite channel is the Weather Channel. And that's, it, you know, I mean, that, and she helps us. She knows what she, it's, you know. Now, I can't watch it for very long. <laughs> but, you know, there, there are local catastrophic events, floods and tidal waves and, and tornadoes and hurricanes but not that are going to destroy the whole earth. 
That happened once. It's not going to happen that way again. Now, judgment will come, but it won't come through blood. It'll come through fire. And that's that's another day, another study. So, these, these events in nature have actually been created by God. Now, we're told in the last days, things will escalate a bit. In fact, there will be earthquakes and violent climactical events that happen on the earth and that is a, sin, a signal to us that hmm, time is moving on we're getting close to something big the next judgment will be by fire not water Noah's three sons Shem, Ham and Japheth repopulated their that, this was their assignment ok guys what are we going to do today we're going to go and multiply and replenish the earth that's your assignment from God. That's what God has called them to do. Repopulate the earth. All the earth's population today came from these three and their wives. Wow. So you know what? We really are all related. If you go back far enough. There are those three guys. Number two. So first of all, we have this cooperation. And, and number two, we have construction. This is a time of construction. The tower begins. And, and so let's go to chapter 11 of Genesis and let's read verses 1 through 9. As we progress now, God stopped the flood and sent them out and said, okay, I've given you some new laws and life on earth is progressing and we're proceeding and life goes on. And here we are in verse chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So we learn here that at this time there had not yet become different languages because all language was the same at this point. There were not all of these different ethnicities, so to speak, and, and through language. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. So they're exploring and they're traveling and they come, uh, and they come to this place which is a really neat, fruitful, beautiful place. And they like it so well, it's like, man, let us just pitch the tents here because this is good. And it was called Shinar. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, listen, go to, let us make brick and burned them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. You construction people will enjoy this, this language. And they said, verse 4 is kind of our key verse. Verse 4. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. There is man's plan. Life goes on. He's spreading out. He's replenishing the earth. And they come to this really cool, pretty, wonderful place, fruitful place, and they say, alright, let's just hold up right here, guys. This looks really good. Let's, let's get some bricks, and let's get some mortar, and let's build a city, and let's build a tower so that we can reach up to heaven and let watch watch the terminology here let us make us a name wow you know that is at the core of most of our problems let us make us a name me Let's make us a city. Let's make us a reputation. Let's, let's let this all be about us. Do you see God mentioned anywhere in verse 4? Do you? I don't. Now, just a few verses ago, Noah and his guys got off the, his family got off the boat and they made an altar and they did what? They worshiped God. Look what's happened. Here they come and there's no God in this verse. It's all about me. Let's make us a city and us a name and us a life. No God. Verse 5. And the Lord came down. Wow. That's interesting. 
God came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they had imagined to do. Verse 7, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. God said. Verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from whence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Verse 9, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. Wow. That's the story of the Tower of Abel. Alright. God told men, what did He tell Noah and his sons to do when they, when they left? What did He say? Go do what? Spread out into all the earth and multiply and replenish. Remember, that's what God told them. They didn't want to do that. You know what they wanted to do? Let's all stay over here at Shinar. This is really nice. Let's all just park right here. I'm tired of traveling anyway. I'm tired of going. Let's stay right here and build us some big old buildings and cities. And let's, in fact, let's do some Let's do some discovery and let's go up there and see if there's really a heaven up there. Let's, let's, let's do this. They began to forget all about God. And, and is this not the cycle of human history? Is, is every society not go through this? For example, the Israelites. Wow. They journey and they struggle and they, they're in the wilderness and God delivers them and they're good and then they go right. That's kind of how we do. We forget. They begin to forget God. They stay congregated in this area of Shinar by the Euphrates River. Let's stay together here and not be scattered. I know God said we're supposed to, but let's just stay here. So what you see here is our plan versus God's plan. They built a huge city. Babylon or Babel. Everyone spoke the same language so they were able to work together at an incredible pace. Verse 4, it's about us and me. And us and me. There's no God here. Let us make a name for ourselves so everyone will know how great we are. That's how men do. That's what men want to do. Let's show them how great we are. Let's build a tower so tall that it would reach up to heaven. Now, they were curious about the sky and stars and space and clouds and the unknown. They were certainly curious about that as we are today. Let's climb to the unknown. This was the first attempt at space exploration. We're here. wonder what's up there. Let's, let's get ourselves up there. They forgot about God. They began to have a fascination with the unknown. That sound familiar? That's fascination for the unknown. They began to worship things other than God. The sun and the moon and stars and, and so on. They built a proud monument to themselves, not to God. God was displeased. Verse 5 said, God came down to see the city and the tower. He saw the future, the potential of mankind. One language, with no restraint. Nothing would be impossible for them. God was, listen, God wasn't against this code. Okay? I don't, I don't think God was against that. Creativity. God is not trying to stop your creativity. In fact, God wants you to be productive. But He wants you to do what He called you to do. He wants you to do what He told us to do. 
he wasn't against discovery of new things, but he wanted them to worship and learn about his plan, his son. Redemption was ahead. God did something to slow down the human progress until after the appearance of Jesus on the earth. Number three, chaos. The progress comes to an abrupt stop. Thud. The work was fully underway. They were making bricks and drying in the sun and mixing sun, sand and water to make mortar. They were carrying water and bringing sand and dirt, carrying bricks and mortar, brick by brick, and they were making progress and building and growing. This city was beginning to appear and this tower that would, would climb to the sky. In the midst of all this work and cooperation, something very strange happened. God confused their language. Chaos ensued. <clears throat> they could no longer communicate and be productive as they worked together because God changed their languages. The result? Mass confusion. Frustration. If you have ever been to a country that does not speak English. Anybody ever done, gone to another country and, and you, you don't have a clue what they're saying? You, you know how that feels? It's really, it's frustrating and you're trying to communicate. You really want to know what they're You don't understand and you can't communicate. That's what happened here. They were trying to work together and all of a sudden there was this chaos. It, it escalated. More noise, more frustration, more chaos. And then fourthly, in your little outline, you see the conclusion. Men finally ended up doing what God had called them to do. Verse 9 says that they were scattered abroad. They gave up eventually and abandoned the tower project because they just couldn't work together because of all these different languages. They couldn't understand each other, and it was really frustrating. Soon all were confused in the city. Normal life became impossible. You, you go to the market to buy uh, produce for your family, and you come to pay, and you can't understand the guy. And you can't ask where this is, because you can't speak their language, and you're frustrated, and it, it just gets so... And people got so frustrated. Normal life could not be maintained. The market, supplies, your neighbors, jobs, food. Life became futile and very chaotic. Families began to move away from the city because of the chaos. Certain groups found each other that could communicate and they went off to specific areas. Shem went, as best we can tell, in the area of Asia. Ham went in the area of Africa. Japheth went toward Europe and into those areas. And beyond, North America, South America, the islands of the sea. People kept moving out farther and farther until finally people were spread out over the whole earth. Which, by the way, is what God told him to do in the first place. So see, what you see here in this story of the Tower of Babel is God's plan versus man's plan. And it became a conflict. Because man wanted to do it his way. And God already gave them instructions on how He wanted to do it. And guess who won in the end? Guess who had their way? God did. Because God is God. And, and sometimes you will think to yourself, well, I know a better way. I, I know a shortcut. If I just try this, it'll be quicker and easier and faster. And I know God said to do it this way, but I'm going to try this. Really? You might want to think through that. Because God's way is always the best way. So it came down to the fact that God told the people what to do. They chose another way. And God said, okay, this is how I wanted it done, so this is how we're going to do it. Because God is God. And God, listen, 
Even though you think things are crazy and out of control on this earth and, and it drives you crazy and it frustrates you and you think the bad guys are winning, they're not. God will have His way. God will have the last say. God will have the final word. So, I think the bottom line of this story is, for me, why don't we just go ahead and obey God? Rather than have to do it my way. You know how strong-willed some of us are? You know how hard-headed some of us are? Well, I just had to try it myself. And how'd that work for you? Usually not too good. God already told us. I have an idea. It's called grace and love and acceptance and forgiveness and repentance and honesty. Those are all God's ideas. Yet, somehow, over time, we humans have thought that maybe I got a better way. By the way, do you know how Satan arrived at where he is. He had a different idea than God did. And he said, I think I'm going to do this my way. In fact, I think I want to be like God. And you see where that has brought us to that. This is what God told him to do in the first place. So do it God's way first. Knucklehead? Hard head? The name of this place of confusion was called Babel or Babylon. Today, many different languages and on earth because of what Noah's descendants did thousands of years ago. Man's way led to chaos and confusion. Disobedience leads to being mixed up and confused. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. God eventually had his way. Let me close as an application. Sin still brings confusion. And ultimately it brings death. When you disobey God's law, it brings death. And pain and confusion and hurt. How many families are broken because of someone chose the way of sin? As opposed to God's way. When your mother tells you to do something and you don't do it, I know what happened at my house. It was chaotic. And it wasn't good for me. I always kind of thought, well, I know a better way. Mama said do that, but I'm going to do it my way. And it didn't turn out good for me. You know what? Mama wanted what's best for me. She wasn't trying to hurt me. She was trying to help me. God is not trying to restrict your creativity. God is trying to protect you because He loves you. You get frustrated and confused and finally, in my house, Mama would have her way. And it usually ended with a switch. Wouldn't it be easier just to obey Him the first time? I mean, seriously, think about it. Wouldn't it just be easier on your family and you and your friends to just obey God the first time? Are you obeying God now? We sang a song that I love. I surrender all. What is it that you're wrestling with right now? Maybe there's an issue or a relationship or something at work or a person. Find it. I don't know what it is. God has given us a direction to go. And God knows what's best for you, better than you know. Wouldn't it be better just to crawl up and find you a place and say, God, I, I, I'm frustrated and I'm, I'm hurt and I'm struggling. But I'm just going to wave the white flag and say, I surrender. I'm tired of fighting. 
and trying to figure this out for myself. I'm tired of that. I just think I'm going to obey you. I want to do what's right. I surrender. That's all God wants. Are you surrendered to God today? Stop and think and obey and repent. Do you know what it means to repent? Don't be afraid of that word. Do you know what it means? It means to change your mind. It's like, okay, I'm going this way, and all of a sudden, uh-oh, that's not probably best, and that's not God's way. I'm going to stop and change my mind and go God's way. That's all it means to repent. It could be that somebody's here today, and you need to change your mind about the direction you're going. And repent and say, God, I've been doing it my way. I'm tired of that. I'm ready to do it your way. Maybe that's what God wants you to do today. Or you can be in denial and you can keep doing it your way and you can keep getting the same result. You all know what that is. Avoid the confusion and avoid the pain. Obey. Repent. Turn it over to God today. Bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to pray. Maybe you want to surrender your battle today. Maybe you're tired of fighting. I, I, I'm just I'm sick of it. God, I'm tired of failing. I'm tired of, of fighting and hurting. And I'm, I'm just tired. So God, I'm just going to, can I just stop and change my mind and let you have this? Will you take this, God? Will you take this? Because I can't deal with it anymore. And just surrender. Just wave the flag. Say, God, I give up. Gonna pray. If you're like that, you just talk to God. Dear God, I know that perhaps sometimes I've tried things my own way, and I've been a little bit of a hard head, been selfish, I put myself first. And God, I, I, I'm sorry. That ain't working out so good. God, I'd like to ask you right now. I, I, I want to change my mind. I want to come back to you. I want to run to you, God. Fall in your arms and surrender to you. God, I believe as my Father, you can take better care of me than I can take of myself. Thank you, God, that your way is better than our way. God, thank you for the lesson, the Tower of Abel. Thank you that you really do know what's best for me. God, I'd ask you to bless our church. God, we have plans. We have dreams. Lord, can I just come back to you today and say, God, would you just do whatever you want with this church? Would you just lead us wherever you want us to go? Would you show us what to do? God, just, just, just lead us and direct us. Be our Father. God, we love you and we thank you. And I pray that truth would change our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all for being here today. Next week, uh, something different. I think you'll enjoy it. If you give to the Lord, there's a black uh, container over here you can tithe or give offerings to the Lord if you do that. Thank you for being with us today. You pray for us, and hopefully we'll see you again next week. God bless you.